Okay. We've got to a uh, sort of interesting moment in the course. At this point, all of a sudden, we can do barely uh, some more interesting kinds of problems. Uh, so we have a lot of material to cover. So today, I'm going to go for two hours instead of one hour, if that's OK with everybody. <laughs> Just kidding. OK. Uh, I do want to try an experiment today, though, which is uh, not really a um, dynamics experiment, but a social experiment, which is I am always curious what groups of people in a room are thinking about. And uh, I'm a little bit embarrassed to uh, ask my own questions. But what I think I'd like to try is, at, towards the end of the class, uh, let you ask questions to the class. And I will do eye clicker scores, but I'll do it anonymously. I won't record the scores. So I'll just put the screen score up, and I won't save it. And if you, just, if you can think of things that you wonder about what your classmates think. And, uh, and you have to say them very loudly. So don't make me, if your questions are of an embarrassing nature, don't ask me to repeat them. Uh, but just, I, I'm always wondering what other people are thinking. So if you want to do that, we have these clickers. And it seems like a fun, just a, it's not dynamics. It's just wasting time, fun thing to do. Social what? Social dynamics. Social dynamics, OK. It could be about dynamics. like. Are you totally, I'm totally confused all the time. Are you? <laughs> OK, another, another general announcement. I, push, I put this on Piazza. Uh, you have uh, several TAs who are trying really hard to do a good job. And some of them, I think, would get a kick out of getting appreciated for that. So you can do some appreciation on the course surveys, which I hope you all fill out. Um, we will read every comment that every student writes. So it's, it's, uh, it, will not, it will not go to waste your time. What you see now uh, is the result of my reading surveys for uh, 30 years. It doesn't mean I've read them perfectly or responded perfectly, but I've tried to respond. And I, I think I am naturally a not talented teacher. And to the extent that I'm any good at all is because I've tried to refine what, I, refine what I'm doing uh, in response to um, these course surveys, and I think even though I'm really old, I could still, uh, I'm not a dog, and I can learn new tricks, maybe. On those surveys, you can write nice things about the TAs also, or constructive criticism. Constructive criticism, in the end, is more useful than the nice things, perhaps. But you can also tell Nanette Peterson, who's the mechanical engineering, uh, sort of running the department from the student point of view, uh, that you have uh, a TA who you think is great, if you do think that, and then they can, they're eligible for a uh, reward of some kind. Okay, on to today's class. At the beginning of the semester, we looked at particle mechanics, and we had F equals MA, and once you got the hang of it and the idea that we're trying to set up and solve differential equations, all the problems with particles are easy. Then if you have two particles and they interact in certain ways, like with gravity or springs or air friction, the problems are also easy. Then we got to this later part of the semester where we put in kin kinematic constraints, geometric constraints. And what, what the deal is with these geometric constraints is that you cannot calculate the forces immediately just knowing the positions and the velocities. So early we had these so-called unconstrained problems where if you know the state of the system, and in dynamics the state is all the positions and all the velocities, you can calculate directly the forces from the constitutive laws, the air friction laws, the spring laws, the gravity laws. Later in the semester we put in things like strings which are different than springs. He says strings seem simpler than a spring, but it's more complicated in that you can't know the tension in the, spring, in the string without solving the dynamics problem. Whereas you can know the tension in the spring just by looking at a photograph of the system. Is that difference clear? Any questions about the difference between these constitutive law <coughs> kinds of ways of calculating forces and these constrained systems the constraints, examples of constraints were strings, rods, sliding on a surface, a hinge, a whole rigid object is a constraint because all the particles are constrained to move with constant distance relative to each other.
calculating the forces in constrained problems is different in nature than the unconstrained. Does somebody want to ask a question about that? You notice that when I just explained that, I was standing still. Yesterday, in my acting class, I'm taking an acting class, we were practicing my little skit, which is like a seventh grade skit. That is like acting class is like seventh grade drama class. And I did my part, and I was walking around going like this. And the teacher afterwards said, look, it's like you can't just walk around and do this. If, you do, if you're walking around like this, nobody can possibly understand what you're saying or pay attention. And I said, oh, that's why none of my students ever learn anything. <laughs> and so maybe my life has changed. I now explain things standing still. So do you understand about the uh, unconstrained forces and the constrained forces? OK. So for example, if we just do a one-dimensional problem like this, we just, we can, if we know the position and velocity, we can calculate this force just from the position and velocity. We can write F equals MA directly. We have second order differential equation. We can, in this particular case, solve it using 293 methods, or remember the analytical solution, or put it in MATLAB. If we have two masses, all of a sudden it's way more complicated, kind of. The solutions are more complicated. We have these modes and these beats and these things moving at different frequencies. But to set up the equations, we draw a free body diagram of this, a free body diagram of that. Knowing the positions, we can calculate the forces. If there are dash pots, knowing the velocities, we can calculate the forces. We can write the second order equations and then solve them at least in MATLAB. Or if you're good at it and know linear algebra and how to use linear algebra with differential equations, you can calculate normal modes and so on. Or if we take this ballistics problem where we have and want to watch how this particle moves in space, it's still a two degree of freedom problem because we have to worry about x and y just like this is two degrees of freedom and this is one degree of freedom. But if we know the position and velocity, we can calculate the forces. For example, the gravity force, we don't even need to know the position. The friction force depends on the velocity. Maybe there'd be a spring connected to it, which, which would, it would depend on position. But we can calculate the force, therefore we can directly write the momentum equations. This kind of situation is different than uh, this kind of situation. And this is, say, where we have a pendulum like this. And we cannot calculate the force at this hinge without setting up and solving the equations. So it's a kinematic constraint, the tension in this thing, or the reaction at this point, if this, is a ma if this rod has mass and x and y. We can't find those without solving the dynamics equation. So this geometric constraint, where we fix something about the geometry, gives us forces which we can't, we can't solve uh, separately. So the hard problems in dynamics, the hardest ones, the ones that, you know, I just taught two more classes after this one, uh, 4,700 and then 6,700, this year, same time, uh, which is just getting better and better at solving these kinematically constrained problems, these, uh, is when you have these constraints, but you want to go from uh, one degree of freedom like this up to, say, two degrees of freedom. And these are like linked... Uh, rigid objects. And these problems all of a sudden get hard, but these are the problems that you need to solve in order to do robotics and machines and most, most useful dynamics problems. Going back to the beginning of the semester when I said this course is useless, it's not useless if you want to do robots, linkages, machines. It's just at the end of this course, you're not quite ready to do it. You're just starting to get ready, and I'm just going to show you some simple problems today. As opposed to 2020, when you left it, you knew the formula, mc over i, things like that. Remember 2020? Can I just teach you the most important formula in 2020, one of them? Because I, I doubt they taught this to you. Which is that the bending moment in a beam is the moment of inertia times the modulus times the curvature. Do you remember that? The curvature is 1 over the radius of the curvature. So the bending moment is the EI divided by the radius of curvature. If you have trouble remembering that, I'm now going to teach you some 2020 so you'll never forget it. This is another aside, but I might as well throw this in since you didn't have me in 2020. Are you ready? <coughs> 
bending moments given by EI over rho. <laughs> okay, so now you learn something in 2020. Okay, now back to this. Now, <laughs> that's courtesy of Dave Bremner, who took 2020 from me in like 1983. Uh, <clears throat> this course. For the most part, to do useful engineering-like calculations, you have to go on and take these more advanced courses. And I'm just going to give you a hint of how that stuff goes today. So let me give you uh, one example. Uh, so you can do these problems. It's not that you can't. It's just that it's, you have to be very systematic and careful. It's just getting used to being systematic and careful is the problem. So let's do uh, this. This is a new gun with no motor. So. Uh, the problem we had before, remember we had this thing I called a new gun where I shot a pellet across the room by putting it on a rod and then flicking my wrist and flicking this rod. I flicked my wrist and flicked this rod. Uh, we treated that problem before as a one degree of freedom problem. There's two moving parts, but we treated it as a one degree of freedom problem. Why was that? It's because I specified for you in the statement of the problem what the motion of this rod was. What if instead I did not specify the motion of this rod, but I said I apply some torque to it? So instead of putting a motor here that specifies the motion, I'm going to put a uh, torque here, and I'd like to know what the motion is then. If we do that, then we have two degrees of freedom in this problem. We have this distance here, I'll call that S, and this angle here. So this is now with uh, no motor constraint. It's not that there's no motor, it's that it's, it's a torque instead. The two degrees of freedom are theta and S. Okay, so this problem is different than the one I did because we don't know what the angle is as a function of time. It's not given to us. We have two degrees of freedom, which means if we want to find the motion, we have to solve differential equations for both s and theta. Maybe they're coupled differential equations, just like these were coupled differential equations. They're not independent. The, the, the acceleration of this depends on the position of that. The acceleration of this depends on the position of that. Here, we fully expect that the acceleration of this will depend on this angle and this rate and so on. And the angular rate here will depend on this acceleration. So we want to find those differential equations. How do we find them? Well, let's just say what the parameters we have in this problem. We have the mass of the rod, IG of the rod, uh, some length of the rod. Uh, we have some position here, G. So G is out here some distance D. Uh, we have this M0. So we have a bunch of parameters. or what we want to think of as, as givens. And these are like the mass of the particle, the mass of the rod, the length of the rod, uh, this distance d, the moment of inertia of the rod, the torque at zero. Um, I don't know if I got them all. Then we have our dynamic variables. And these are like theta and s. And associated with these, we have a theta dot and an s dot and a theta double dot and an s double dot. And what we know is that all of these things in combination satisfy all the laws of geometry and mechanics. We want to figure out what the motion is. Well, if we could figure out what these two quantities are in terms of these, then we could write differential equations. We would then know the rate of change of this variable. We know the rate of change of this variable because we know this. And we can then set this up in MATLAB to solve. So our big goal in problems like this is to find these in terms of the other things. And that, and that means what's called finding the equations of motion. Now if you find this boring, remember you can be working on the question that you want to ask the class to figure to do this anonymous polling. 
So you have two different interesting things you can think about. Okay, so how do we do that? Uh, well, we draw free body diagrams. We're going to do this using the laws of mechanics. So the free body diagrams we can draw for this system look like this. We can draw a free body diagram of the whole system. We can draw a free body diagram of just the rod. Or we can draw a free body diagram of just the mass. And if we look at these free, free body diagrams, only two of these are independent. In particular, you can add this free body diagram to this free body diagram. And the addition is very literal. You take this whole drawing and put it on top of this whole drawing, and you get this drawing. There might be some arrows that cancel, but that's what you get. OK, so how does this free body diagram look? Well, here's a simple one. We have the rod here, and we have a force from the rod on this uh, thing. Let's, just, let's assume there's no friction for this one. And we have that force in that, in, uh, normal to the rod. How does this free body diagram work? Well, we have action and reaction. And you can express that by using the same scalar n multiplied by the opposite unit vector. Or if we wrote this as a vector, we'd have to put negative the vector here. To get action and reaction straight, which is often really confusing, uh, look in the early chapters of the book about free body diagrams and uh, mechanisms and so on. And it tries to explain, as best I know how, uh, how to be clear about action and reaction in free body diagrams. Then this free body diagram has forces here. And then it has the forces here of this thing, which is, uh, no, completely wrong. Nothing shows here. Because these are internal forces in this system. This is the complete free body diagram. We're, we're leaving gravity off, of course. Now, if we think we know all of this stuff above, and we're trying to find these two things, we'd like to find two equations for those things. But how many unknowns do we have? Well, we have these unknowns, and we also have all of these reaction forces are unknown. Yes, your question is? Now are you happy? <laughs> OK, now how many people saw all of those errors? Raise your hand. OK, very good. You're not going to be able to live in the assisted living facility with me then. <laughs> OK, back to where I was. We've got these two unknowns. But now we've added three more on those, which are those reaction forces. So if we want to find those reaction forces and uh, these things, we're going to have to write five equations. What five equations could we write? Well, we could write angular momentum balance for this system. That's one equation. Linear momentum balance for this system. That's two equations. So that's three total. And over here, how many equations can we write? Linear momentum balance and angular momentum balance? No, it's a particle. You do not get three equations for a particle. You only get two. Because there's no degree of freedom associated with the rotation. So if we wrote linear and angular momentum balance here and linear momentum balance here, we'd have five equations. We could solve those for those three reaction forces and these two quantities. But let's say we don't care about the reaction forces. Can we? find two independent equations that will give us theta double dot and s double dot without finding those reaction forces. So this is the big trick in these hard dynamics problems, is how to finesse the re reaction forces that you don't care about. The forces that enforce the kinematic constraints, you don't care about them if all you're trying to do is find the motion. How do you finesse finding them? How do you do it the American way? What's the gun you use to kill those things that you don't know 
and don't care about? Zero. What? Zero. <laughs> In the end, everything is zero. Yes? Right. So if we take angular momentum balance of this system about this point, that gives us one equation which does not have reaction forces in it. So, so if we take angular momentum balance with respect to O of the system, then we have the sum of moments with respect to O equals H dot with respect to O. On the left hand side we have zero. On the right hand side we have the position of the particle with respect to O crossed with the mass of the particle times the acceleration of the particle. And then we have plus the position of G with respect to O crossed with the mass of the rod times the acceleration of the rod. And then we have plus I of the rod about its center of mass theta double dot K. When I did my uh, notes, I was doing the moment free case. And just at the last second, I decided to treat you guys to a, a gun with a, with a torque on it. What? I make a mistake? No. Okay. So this is an equation with parameters theta dot theta, s, s dot, and the things we're interested in, theta double dot and s double dot, and we'll call this equation one. So we take all this stuff as known, this is one equation and two unknowns. Now can we find one more equation that does not have reaction forces in it, but does have those other quantities in it? So we're looking for another thing which is true. So momentarily, we think we know everything. We know all the positions, velocities, and accelerations. We want to write something true about them. Then we're going to pretend that we know only the positions and velocities and we'll try and solve for the accelerations. Momentarily, assuming we know everything, can you write any true equation that does not have in it any of the constraint forces? Yes? That is correct. So if we take linear momentum balance of the particle in the ER direction. How do we do that? We write sum of the forces equals the mass times acceleration. And we take the dot product of both sides of this equation with ER. What does it give us? On the left hand side it gives us zero. On the right hand side it gives us the mass of the particle times the acceleration of the particle, which we know in terms of uh, the parameters and theta, theta dot, theta double dot, s, s dot, and s double dot. So a technical exercise, which you all should be good at now, is evaluating these expressions in terms of these things. And evaluating this expression in terms of these things. If we take these two equations, one and two, one and two are two equations for theta double dot and s double dot. And this is what we call the equations of motion. So then we can find the angle as a function of time as well as uh, the s as a function of time by solving the differential equations in the mo of the, of the uh, differential equations of motion. So wait a second, let me say it again. Once we've solved those equations, we can find theta double dot and s double dot in terms of s 
s dot, theta, and theta dot, and the parameters. Therefore, we can set up the equations of motion and solve them on the computer to find theta as a function of time and s as a function of time. Yes? I cannot hear you. For those of you in TV land, he asked me to make that correction. Any other comments or questions about this? Is any, who sees their way through doing this problem? Who does not? So if you don't, what, what, part, what part of actually finding, if I gave you all the masses and uh, lengths and moments of inertia, what would prevent you from finding position as a function of time and angle as a function of time? Yes? Is that acceleration term in the second equation? Yes. Is that the five-term acceleration? This is the five-term acceleration formula. It's the polar coordinate acceleration formula. It's the Cartesian coordinate acceleration formula. It's the path coordinate acceleration formula. It's whatever formula you want to use that calculates the acceleration. You would like to use appropriate formulas so that when you're given these things, you can calculate this. What are some easy ways to do that is using polar coordinates or using the five-term acceleration formula. If you choose to use the five-term acceleration formula, you can evaluate this several ways depending what you use for your moving coordinate system. All of them will give you the same acceleration. Famous formula, acceleration equals acceleration. Does that address your question? Yes? Another question. Think of the hit by a truck thing. Professor Reader just explained this thing. I lost my notes. He got hit by a truck. I'm not allowed to graduate unless I can do a MATLAB plot of the motion of this particle and this problem. What is it that you would need to know in order to do that? Yes? Uh, this is this is a g actually. Uh, no, it's not given. So that's why this problem is different from the one we did last week, and we'd have to calculate that acceleration in terms of these variables here: theta, theta dot, and theta double dot. But g is just going in circles, so it's easy to calculate this acceleration. Does that address your question? But you helped me find a typo there. Choco. Any other questions? Okay, so now I want to go and do a harder problem. I guess I have to do it quickly. Uh, this is this famous double pendulum. This is actually a double double pendulum. very carefully designed for shipping. Uh, why is it a double-double pendulum? It's to illustrate a point about chaos and so on, which I will show you. So please ignore the, this uh, pendulum on the back. It's, it's, a, it's a, for a different purpose, which I'll show you in a minute. This is a double pendulum, which is different from a single pendulum. So before today, you were experts at solving this problem. Now, after today, you'll be semi-experts in solving this problem. This problem is famous because of the following phenomenon. It follows deterministic rules. Newton's laws, the equations which we're teaching you in this close class. What's that, a tachographical error? Uh, but what happens is that even though we're solving these deterministic equations, you get this chaotic motion. So this is one of the simple examples of chaos, where starting with something simple and solving these equations, which you can write down, you get this chaotic motion. What are the hallmarks of chaos? Is it looks complicated. 
Another hallmark of chaos is the following. If we take the simple, simple pendulum equation and we start these things together as accurately as we can, they keep moving together. They're not coupled to each other. They're, they're independent. I'll show you they're independent. But if I start them together, they move together. They only drift apart very slowly if I have made some small error in maybe the mass distribution or the initial conditions. This is different from the situation with these complicated chaotic-like systems where no matter how accurately I try to start them the same, they will exponentially diverge from each other. So they start out about the same, but then the motions become quite different from each other. And there's, no matter how hard I try, I can't make them move the same because uh, it's the nature of the solutions of these nonlinear differential equations that they exponentially diverge from each other. In the low amplitude uh, uh, phase, they're not that different from each other, but it, in the high amplitude, they're quite different. Let me try it again, just a little higher, a little higher amplitude. The solutions exponentially diverge. It doesn't matter how close I try to make them to each other, they will diverge. Okay, so the question is, can we get a computer to give us the same result? Uh, to save time, I am going to skip drawing pictures of this on the blackboard. I would like in your mind to remember that this is bar one, this is bar two, this is the lambda one direction, this is the n one direction, this is the lambda two direction, this is the m two direction, this angle is theta, this angle is theta 1, this angle is theta 2, and we're going to try to write the equations in motion. And I'm going to show you how to do that on the computer. Or I'm going to attempt to show you how to do that on the computer. Think of your questions that you would like to um, ask the class. Okay, quick before I do this double pendulum, who has a question they'd like to ask the class about anything? Anybody have anything they're not too embarrassed? First of all, I know you all have questions. You would like to know what other people are thinking. And I know that the vast majority of those questions are things you cannot say out loud. Okay, so can you think of something you are willing to say out loud that you'd like to know about the opinions about your classmates? Yes? Were Ross and Rachel friends really on a break? Were Ross and Rachel... <laughs> what's the question? Were Ross and Rachel... Say it loud. On a break? Do you understand? Okay. A, uh, yes, B, no, C, you don't know what the hell he's talking about. <laughs> okay. Okay, next question. You gotta be curious about something. Okay, I got one for you. Was that picture of Willie Warhoft actually an old picture of Professor Zellman Warhoft, or was it a picture of a TV character? A, the actual Professor Warhoft, an old picture. B, some television movie character. C, you don't know what I'm talking about, or you don't know.
Does anybody actually know the right answer to that question? Yes? Oh, there is no right answer to that question. <laughs> I, was, I was really confused by that. Okay. We've done that exercise. You're going to have fantasies for the rest of your life that you wished you would have asked X, Y, Z, and W because you don't get these opportunities often. Okay. So <clears throat> we would like to get the equations of motion. The way we're going to do that is we're, what, what are we trying to get? We're trying to get the right-hand side file. This is the z dot file, and we're going to have theta 1 is, is a z1, theta 2 is z3. I've done it in a different order than I usually do it. And we want to calculate the rate of change of all these things, so we want to get a z dot, and that's going to be theta 1 dot, theta, uh, theta 2 dot, theta 1 double dot, theta 2 double dot. And we've got that uh, for equations of motion that the rate of change of theta 1 is theta 1 dot. The rate of change of theta 2 is theta 2 dot. We have to get these two angular accelerations. And what do we get is we get this formula here, which is um, what you, which you now know how to derive using principles of linear and angular momentum balance. Okay, so this is why these simple ideas get confusing to deal with. Now the question is, can, is there a way to manage such gigantic equations uh, and still not make mistakes? And the, and the easiest way to do that is to use symbolic algebra. And MATLAB, for example, has uh, symbolic algebra in it. And here is how to derive those equations with symbolic algebra. And it's very much like what you would do by hand. It's just you hide all the, all the derivations. So for example, if we knew what uh, unit vectors i, j, and k are, well, those, those are represented by the string of numbers 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. Uh, we're we're going to say all these variables are symbolic. Then we could figure out what a unit vector was along the rods, what cosine and sine of theta. We use three-dimensional vectors so that we can do things like k cross to, get to, do, to, to calculate things. We can calculate, for example, using that k cross, we can calculate the n1 and n2 directions, orthogonal to the, to, the, to the two rods. And now we've got all these unit vectors in terms of theta 1 and theta 2. And remember, we're going to work our way up and try and express everything in terms of theta 1, theta 2, theta 1 dot, theta 2 dot, theta 1 double dot, theta 2 double dot. Then we're going to solve for theta 1 double dot, theta 2 double dot, and those are the equations of motion. We can write these position vectors in terms of those unit vectors. They're unit vectors times some given length. Uh, other pos all the different position vectors, like where is the center of mass of one <laughs> bar compared to O, or the other bar compared to the hinge, and so on. Here I have R02G1. It looks like a mess, capital, uppercase, lowercase, whatever. But it is uh, just meant to be the position of the center of mass of the first rod with respect to O. And this is from O to G1. And what is that? That's the unit vector along bar 1 times that length, which we assume is given. And so we can calculate all these position vectors. These are now three component vectors. The third component of all of them is 0. Then we can calculate things like the acceleration. What's the acceleration of the middle of the lower rod with respect to point O? Well, it's got a centripetal acceleration, theta 1 dot squared times this position vector with a minus sign. And it's got a, a acceleration tangent to the circle it's going around. That's theta 1 double dot k cross that position vector. And there are various ways to think about that formula. You can think about it as coming from the polar coordinate formula or from the five term acceleration formula. Similarly, we can calculate the acceleration of the hinge relative to O. It's exactly the same formula, but it's just got different position vectors in it. And similarly, we can calculate the acceleration of the, the middle of the second rod with respect to the hinge. It's the same, same looking formula, but this has to do with theta 2 dot squared and theta 2 double dot. And then we can calculate the acceleration of the middle of the second rod with respect to uh, the origin. And that's the acceleration of point E with respect to the origin plus the acceleration of G2 with respect to the origin. Now, in MATLAB's symbolic head, at this point, we have a very complicated formula. 
but we don't see it because it's happening in the background in symbolic algebra, like with Mathematica, those of you who know Mathematica. We can calculate the moment vectors by taking cross products of positions and the gravity force. And we can calculate the rate of change of angular momentum of the system, and that's uh, the sum of two terms, the rate of change of angular momentum of the first bar plus the rate of change of angular momentum of the second bar. This is the m1 times the cross product of the position and the acceleration plus the moment of inertia times theta double dot. And then for, to get the angular momentum of the whole system, we take the rate of change of angular momentum, to get the rate of change of angular momentum of the whole system, we add the rates, we add the terms from the two parts. So this is the first bar, that's the formula you know, and this is the second bar, that's the formula you know well. Then we can also use angular momentum balance of the second bar about the second hinge. Why is that a nice equation? Because it doesn't have in it any unknown reaction forces. Notice this one didn't have any unknown reaction forces because the free body diagram I used is the free body diagram of the system about point O and I'm taking, I'm looking at angular momentum balance relative to point O. So I've got these two rates of change of angular momentum. To write the angular momentum balance equation, I set the moment equal to the rate of change of angular momentum. The way the symbolic program works is it likes for equations, rather than to have the right side equal left side, it wants you to put it all on one side and set it equal to zero. So the meaning of an equation in this toolbox is a whole set of terms which you're going to add to zero. So this is moments equal rate of change of angular momentum for the system, moments equal rate of change of angular momentum for the second bar. But these three things are, these two things are vector expressions because I've been doing everything with vectors, but they only have a k component. So I'm just going to pull out the k component of those equations. The, the x and y components are zero because all of the terms came from various cross products or k vectors. And now these are giant expressions that have in them all the parameters and all the positions and all the velocities and all the accelerations. But what I want is I want to solve these two equations for these two quantities, these two accelerations, which I care about and I'm going to call the result of that uh, R1 and R2. Those are two giant expressions. Those are the expressions I showed you in that right-hand side file. Unfortunately, in MATLAB, symbolic uh, results are not the same as a text string, so you have to do this command which says turn the symbolic result into a character string, and then if you want to ask it to simplify the expression, you simplify it. So here is R1, first simplify it, then turn it into a text string, and this is a text string, which is that thing we want on the right-hand side of the differential equation. Same with this one. Now we want to get that into a file. We, can, we could print this out and cut and paste it into a file. Or what I've done here is I've made that automatic, and I've had this MATLAB program write another MATLAB program. So the output of this MATLAB program is a text file. What is that text file? It's the right-hand side file, which I just showed you. So this is a set of commands which prints out that right-hand side file. It starts out with, with these uh, uh, commands which have to do with how do, you do, how do you write files in MATLAB. Then it has, okay, print the first line, and here is the first line of that function file. And then it says print the second line of the function file. And here you see from this point down are all of the lines of that, text fi of that file except for the giant intimidating differential equations, and I put those as variables, and it prints out the value of that variable, which is the text string, which is the differential equation. So here is the right-hand side file. All using the whole derivation of the equations is just this. All commands which you can understand. It's just that when you put them together, it's tons of algebra. If you try to do it for example, on a final exam, none of you will get through it with no algebra mistakes. If I give it for a homework assignment, two out of a hundred of you will get through it with no algebra mistakes. If you do it in MATLAB, it does the algebra correctly. Okay, then how do you, how do you run this thing? So remember, the output of that was this file. That was just the, that was the printed output of that, of that previous file. How do, we, how do we run this? I have a, a program which is uh, what I call a driver program. What does this driver program do? It's, uh, it it uh, clears things up, it sets parameters. Uh, this is legacy code. It's before I learned to do p dot, which I've taught you. 
So I don't do p dot, and as a consequence, uh, other things are much more of a mess. Uh, I set up a bunch of stuff for the animation. I set up the initial conditions. By the way, I gave you a puzzle problem before, which none of all of you failed, which is, remember, remember the question is, what would you do if I was hit by a truck and you were asked to calculate the motion of that new gun? You were supposed to say, you would need to know the initial conditions, which I didn't give you. All right, to solve the differential equation, you need the initial conditions also. So here's the initial conditions I'm using for uh, this particular double pendulum. These zeros correspond to letting it go from a horizontal position. Uh, we put in uh, that as initial conditions here. We use the ODE options command so we can set the accuracy. And then we have the ODE command, which you know well. I used ODE 23. I could have used ODE 45. I said, here's the right-hand side function, the one we printed out. Here's the T-span. Here's the initial condition. Here's the options. Dot, dot, dot means go on to the next line. And instead of just putting a P here, I listed all the parameters a place to make mistakes. If I put these out of order compared to what I had in the uh, printout of the right-hand side file, I would get things wouldn't go as I want. The P command is better. And then I plot the result and then I animate it. How do I animate it? Just using things that you've already learned about how to animate things. Uh, you, you, um, you just uh, draw pictures again and again and again. And you, get a, and you get the animation. Here I use the line command, which is a fancy way of doing the animation, um, which makes it go a little faster, but you don't have to do it that way. So it's just, this is just drawing things, drawing them rotated, draw again and again. What do you get when you do this? Uh, let's go back here and look at this driver. I just run this thing, and it, what does it do? The first thing it does is it um, uh, derives the equations. Here, it derives the equations in this line of the code, which I presented out, but I'll let it derive the equations again. So it derives the equations. After it derives them, it prints that file. After it prints that file, it sets up the, uh, the uh, animation, and then it does this animation, which isn't going quite as fast as the physical pendulum there, but maybe I could change that. And these innocent initial conditions give this chaotic motion. And it's not because there's something random in the process, it's because it's the nature of nonlinear dynamical systems that the solutions are incredibly complicated, or can be incredibly complicated. And that's the whole subject of chaos, as in Jurassic Park and the, the chaos scientist. Yes? So, um, in previous mental models, you said beta, 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 Uh, I did act. Uh, I think I think what I used is the horizontal to correspond to the MATLAB graphics. So I, I, actually, the, when I when I said over here, what are these angles theta? I said, remember what these thetas are. I lied to you. I meant that theta one was this angle and theta two is that angle. Okay, any questions about anything for 30 seconds? Yes? I'll post this code on the MATLAB samples website, not on Piazza. Any other questions? Yes? I am not going to post the code from last lecture. The reason I'm not is because it's just a mess with all the weird graphics. It's easy enough for you to write it yourself. Yes? If I run this again in MATLAB, it will be exactly the same because MATLAB is a deterministic program. It doesn't use uh, real numbers. It uses fixed, it, in the background are bits and bytes and it has exactly the same set of bits and bytes that it calculates with. If I ran it again and changed the initial conditions by one part in 10 to the 15th, then it would give a different solution. So if I do the experiment twice, I get two different solutions. If I do the experiment, the calculation twice on a computer with IEEE standard arithmetic, it gives exactly the same result each time you run it. If you seed it with TC, TC differences in initial conditions, it gives different solutions. Okay, class is over. It's been a pleasure. Goodbye. See you. <laughs>